Hey, BookTube. Welcome back to the History Shelf. My name is Peg. Thanks for joining me today, this evening. It is a Monday. Happy Monday to all of you out there. Say I'm coming at you today with a stack of new military history titles um, from our good folks, our good friends at Casemate. Um, we've got a selection of Casemate titles, Pen and Sword. Um, yeah. I think that's it. Casemate and Pen and Sword imprints. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Um, slim little volume here, uh, kind of relating to uh, world events. Uh, will be a very fast read. 160 odd pages. We've got Vladimir Putin, the world's most dangerous man. Question mark. Um, <laughs> by James Greensmith. Well, in a world full of dangerous people right now, and he's definitely up there. Um, and now we've got Iran. So we've got a lot of fun things happening in the world, not really. But uh, James Greensmith, let's see here. Okay, let's, let's do this. Um, following the celebrations of the millennium and our entry, into the 21st century, it was to be hoped that the days when a brutal dictator could bring mindless death and destruction to another country and even to his own people were over, and that the lessons of the past had been well and truly learned. A forlorn hope as it transpires for yet another monster has raised its ugly head above the slimy cesspit with such monsters, which such monsters inhabit, one to rival those of the past, such as Stalin, Hitler, and Pol Pot. For now, we have Vladimir Putin, a depraved, deranged, warmongering megalomaniac who threatens the peace of the entire planet. In former times, the appropriate description of Putin would have been evil, a monster, the devil incarnate, ghoulish, an excrescence, that is a great word, uh, etc. But we no longer live in the Middle Ages, and such appellations no longer suffice. In any way, what adjective exists to describe a person who has no respect for human life? In their place, we have the terminology of modern-day psychiatry. So, is it possible to get inside the mind of Putin and discover what makes this ruthless, brutal, and amoral dictator tick? The answer is yes, but it is not to be found in any textbook of psychiatry. Instead, the clues are to be found in a scientific paper published by a female psychiatrist as long ago as the year 1997 and in the known side effects of the illness from which he is currently suffering. Uh, a new and unique insight is now offered into the mind of Putin, one which has not previously been advanced. Well, this was not what I was expecting. Uh, okay. Based on a little-known paper written by a female psych, uh, psychiatrist in 1997. We'll see, uh, we'll see what's going on. That's interesting. That's an interesting um, revelation there, that they're going to look at a paper written in 97 to try to get inside the mind of this guy, this monster. Um, <clears throat> well, let's see here. Um, I've got another one similar to that. Okay, so then we have a study, more military in, um, in approach, and this is Putin's wars, NATO's flaws, why Russia invaded Ukraine. That almost sounds slightly apologetic, but this is by Paul Moorcraft. Um, NATO's flaws. Okay, well, well, we'll figure this out together. This is a uh, pen and sword. Okay, so this book explores why there is a major war again in Europe. Putin's actions need to be understood if not forgiven. With the U Ukraine conflict increasingly seen as a proxy war of NATO versus Russia, how likely is the fighting to spread? The author, a highly respected journalist and political commentator, explains why Russia invaded a sovereign neighbor. To what extent did NATO's expansion to Russia's borders in the aftermath of the Cold War provoke Putin? Did the West's recent humiliating defeats in the Middle East and South Asia encourage Putin to exploit what he saw as its 
decadent strategic weakness, weakness and lack of resolve? What were the reasons for Russia's savage behavior in Ukraine? How might the Ukraine war end and what will the postbellum world look like? Well, it says Professor Moorcraft, who has worked in Ukraine and has witnessed Russian troops in action in, in Afghanistan and other theaters, is superbly qualified to write this work. Um, okay. It's a little less than 200 pages. So he's going to move briskly through this, it looks like. Um, so yeah, two interesting new studies on the current events of uh, the Ukraine war, Putin. Um, so I probably will read these two together, actually. This makes sense. So we've got two new titles from Penn and Sword from Casemate on Russia. Oops. Ooh. Oh, and sorry, there was one more Russian book here. I think there, uh, yeah, one more uh, uh, study, although this goes, yeah, no, okay. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. Um, as you can see, the girls are sleeping. Everything's kind of quiet here before a storm. Are we supposed to get some rain tonight? So uh, everyone's kind of sleepy. I, I kind of am too. It's been a... a it's been a good day. It's been a work a good work day, but I'm I'm ready for some downtime. Um, this book is the Russian invasion of Ukraine, February to December of 2022, destroying the myth of Russian invincibility, by Major General U.S. retired John S. Harrell. Okay, destroying the myth of Russian invincibility. Fantastic. Is that? <laughs> Someone giving the finger to, uh, is that a Russian ship? Okay, that's interesting. Um, well, I got a lot of books here, so I won't get into all of it, but this uh, provides a clear narrative of the war from the start of the invasion to the end of 2022. Expert, well-informed analysis from former U.S. Army officer who helped train Ukrainian Army and previously commanded Ukrainian troops on U.N. operations explains Russia's objectives and the strategic decisions, as well as the reasons for their failure, explains the Ukrainian defensive response and the reasons for their successes so far, eh, including the role played by Western military aid. Okay, I won't go any further. Focus is squarely on the military uh, operations. And there are plenty of maps throughout to give people a sense of what is happening here. Um, ground, ground conquest of the Black Sea coast. There we go. Twenty first century lend lease in the arsenals of democracy. So we also got color color photos in the in the middle. Um, so three brand new books on the conflict. Um, so I'll be reading all three together. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'm really looking forward to reading this one because I've heard a lot about it. Um, it's a small little volume. Well, yes, this story needs to be known more about what happened when we pulled out of Af Afghanistan and particularly what happened at the Abbey Gate. And this new book does that. Life and Death at, at Abbey Gate, The Fall of Afghanistan and the Operation to Save Our Allies by Michael Cook, Michael Cook, with Robert Conlon. It's a slim little volume. This is a casemate title. It says here, as America's last days in Afghanistan came to a chaotic end, a group of American veterans saw the writing on the wall. The people who had supported them on the ground over the past two decades were going to be left behind. They sprang into action, undertaking an extraordinary mission to honor the U.S. battlefield creed to leave no comrade behind. Relying on cell phones and satellites as their weapons, they worked feverishly around the clock to help evacuate as many Afghans who had supported U.S. troops as possible. These allies and their families had to flee via Hamid Karzai International Airport's Abbey Gate, where Marines of the 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, were working in conditions that brought combat-hardened veterans to tears. 
told through the eyes of Mikhail, his Afghan friend Abdul, and the the two one Marines on the ground. Uh, Life and Death at Abbey Gate is an important story that should be read by all Americans. I agree. I read another work on this about a year ago, a year or two ago, a year ago, a couple of years ago, um, detailing the frantic efforts to get people out. Um, and it was really, really harrowing. Um, so I look forward to reading this, although I'm sure it's going to sadden me. And these are the uh, photo of the 13 American uh, killed and warriors killed in the blast at Abbey Gate. You know, I'm former military. I'm a vet. So these things matter to me. You know, I, in a, in a, in an age where it seems like no one really wants to wear the uniform or serve their country anymore, it's, uh, it's, it's up to me and people like me to, to remember and talk about military issues and, and the people in the military, um, to just remind people of the sacrifices that people do make and have made and continue to make. And whether it's, um, just deployments and being away from home and family members to actually losing their lives uh, in the service of this country. It means something. And I'm, I'm tired of, you know, I'm tired of people who just laugh at things like that. Like it doesn't matter. And we're all world citizens. It's, it's, it's baloney. Um, it means something to wear the uniform and take an oath, you know, it, and uh, yeah, it's coming from a vet. I'm a veteran. I wore the uniform and I'm very proud of it. So I will remember them and read these books and bring them to you because that's just the, that's, that's the least I can do, right? So check out Mikhail Cook's Life and Death at Abbey Gate. Oh, boy. Crazy world we live in. <laughs> okay. What else do we have here? Um, I don't know what to do next. <laughs> Let's just get through it. So this is an, a nice, deep, immersive book. This is a, a deeper read, almost like a, uh, 350 pages. Um, kind of like autobiography or memoir. It's memoir, and I love memoirs. And this is a Al J. Venter's Taka Taka Bomb Bomb. <laughs> it's a great name. Taka Taka Bomb Bomb, an intrepid war correspondent's 50-year odyssey. Um. Let's see here. The world's oldest still active war correspondent, Al J. Venter, has reported from the front lines for well over half a century, witnessing the horrors humanity visits upon itself in 25 conflict zones across Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia. In this memoir, he masterfully recounts his experiences, sharing the real stories behind the headlines and the sharp lessons he learned that enabled him to survive his countless exploits ranging from exposing a major KGB operative in Rhodesia entirely by accident and accompanying an, an Israeli force led by Ariel Sharon into Beirut to gun running into the United States. Wow. Well, Al J. Vent, Venter, uh, he's, he's had 50 books published. I have, wow. Never, never heard of any of these, but I'm looking forward to reading about his exploits here. Where else does he go? Um, oh, this is interesting. Becoming a war correspondent by accident after starting work in Nigeria in 1967, uh, just two days after an army mutiny, he was almost killed twice within his first three days as the country descended into civil war and chaos. Venter entered conflict zones across Africa, repeatedly risking arrest and on numerous occasions cheating death while reporting from the front as hostilities erupted in Rhodesia, Angola, Sudan, Sierra Leone, and the Congo. Twice he was wounded, once by an anti-tank mine in Angola that left him partially deaf. Hmm. Oh, he's, he's led a very, a very full life here. Wow. There are copious photographs. There's two different sections in the book. Um, 
If you like war and military memoirs, um, I think this could this will be a really enjoyable read. This is a casemate title, we should add. So that's out right now. Um, yeah. Indeed. Okay. There's so many great books from Casemate. Uh, next one, we're going to go... Oh, and I recognize this author. We're going to go back to World War II. Uh, and this is uh, Eyes on the Enemy, U.S. Military Intelligence in World War II by Chris McNabb. Slim little volume. Casemate title. Um, let's see here. Ooh, we get into some real big details here. Let me just say, in December seventh, on December seventh, nineteen forty-one, obviously Pearl Harbor happened. Um, they took advantage. The Japanese carrier strike force took advantage of what was one of the most profound intelligence failures in U.S. history. Galvanized into action, the branches of the U.S. military subsequently developed one of the greatest, albeit imp imperfect, intelligence gathering and analysis networks of the combat combatant nations opening an invaluable window onto the intentions of their enemies. Um, the picture of U.S. military intelligence during World War II is a complex one. Yes, it is. So it was divided between these different uh, intelligence units. Uh, there was uh, HUMANT, which means, uh, that's the acronym HUMANT, human intelligence. Then you had uh, SIGINT, which is signal intelligence. Um, and then now, like a military intelligence division, MID, uh, then you, so MID, MIS, Office of Naval Intelligence, ONI, then you had the Office of Strategic Services, OSS. Um, so, but this book um, reveals the theoretical and practical principles behind wartime intelligence gathering and analysis from the frontline intelligence officer to the Washington-based codebreaker. They explain fundamentals such as how to observe and record enemy activity and intercept enemy radio traffic through to specialist activities such as cryptanalysis, photo recon reconnaissance, prisoner interrogation, and undercover agent operations. Um, fabulous. So it's all about... Um, yeah, it gives a unique insight into the work of American military intelligence during World War II. Um, using original documents. I see. Okay. Yeah, so we've got like radio transmission records here. And then um, what else do we use here? This is from the Signal Corps field manual. This kind of gives you, it's, it's just... It's not focusing, but you get the picture. Um, eyes on the enemy. Woo, then we have a big World War II uh, from Pen and Sword. We have Stalin's plans for capturing Germany by Bogdan Musial. Look at this bodacious book. Disproves the narrative of the Soviet Union as a peaceful power. What narrative was that? <laughs> I don't think I ever read that narrative. Uh, <laughs> as a peaceful power. Okay. Um, it says here, primary sources from inside the Soviet state apparatus, including now inaccessible Russian archival holdings. Groundbreaking research on Soviet industrialization and foreign policy before the Second World War. Detailed description of the collectivization and Stalinist terror. And then it disproves a, a narrative that never existed. I don't know who was saying they were a peaceful power. Um, definitely some nice use of photos in here. We got uh, period photos here. Uh, okay, let's get into what he's saying here. The myth of Soviet benevolence has largely been discredited, correct? But the idea... The Soviet Union under Stalin was a peaceful, defensive-minded power that sought to prevent war by any means possible, including an ill-fated non-aggression treaty with Nazi Germany, remains surprisingly popular to this day. Does it? Does it really? Not in my circle of uh, 
you know, acquaintances and people who have written about this. Um, indeed, it has been revived to justify contemporary Russian aggression, most notably against Ukraine. But even outside of Russia, a host of Western intellectuals still subscribe to the narrative of a peaceful Soviet Union. I mean, I don't, I don't know who these people are, but they're, they're not very um, well read. Drawing on a host of internal Soviet Politburo discussions, memoranda, and speeches, this book shows that the Soviet Union was a heavily militarized state that incessantly planned to unleash a great ideologically motivated war against the rest of the world. In fact, its entire political life revolved around the question of war, especially following the onset of the Great Depression in 1929, which, which convinced Soviet leaders of the imminent collapse of the capitalist system abroad. Thus, both the collectivization as well as the terror that followed in its wake were done with the coming war in mind, even though there was no tangible danger of war. Slowed down by countless devastating setbacks, Stalin was nevertheless able to amass a gigantic army by the late 1930s. When Hitler approached Stalin in 1939 asking for Soviet neutrality in his planned invasion of Poland, Stalin sensed a golden opportunity. By supporting Hitler, he could turn the European powers against each other allowing him to intervene once they were sufficiently weakened. However, Stalin miscalculated. Hitler beat both Poland and France in less than a year and then turned against Moscow in 1941, long before Stalin was ready for his own attack. Interesting. Okay. I will read this just because I'm, I read everything I can about Soviet Union and uh, Russia. Um, and it's an interesting premise. I mean, I, I don't need any persuading, but um, if anything, it just underscores, you know, what I've already come to know <laughs> about Soviet Union during that time. And uh, we'll see how he ties it into um, justifications for the Ukrainian war today. That'll be an interesting um uh, connection he tries to to draw there so stalin stalin's plans for capturing germany by bogdan museum this is a pen and sword book all right what's next Ooh. um let's go to this one because now we're going to go back to speaking of the uh, dictators and madmen and everything this I think this is part of a, a three-part look and I, I asked for the other two in this series because it's interesting to me but um this is Hitler's Imperfect Victories Campaigns in Western Europe 1939 to 41 by Rex Bashford um another pen and sword imprint book yes I, I was right first of three books so I, I've asked for the other two uh this is the first of three books looking at how Hitler was able to install himself as leader of the army, Luftwaffe, and Kriegsmarine, and how well he performed these roles. Um, uh, the book is based entirely on the evidence of the most senior military personnel who were there at the time, from their contemporaneous diaries and subsequent writings. Interesting. Um, let's see here. The sources used include the diaries and recollections of three chiefs of the army general staff, Field Marshals Rommel, von Ronstedt, von Bock, von Kleist, von Manstein, von, von Manstein, I should say, numerous other senior generals, Hitler's military adjutants, ministers of his government, and evidence from the trial of the major war criminals at Nuremberg. Um, is there a consistent thread in this evidence? The first volume is called Imperfect Victories and deals with the Polish, Scandinavian, and French campaigns. Oh, I see. Let me back up because what he's trying to do is get at the claim that was made of what Hitler called himself. Um, So Rex Bashford says there has never been a comprehensive analysis of Hitler's role as, as the supreme military leader of the Third Reich across all the major campaigns. He combined every senior position in government and the armed forces until he was at the same time supreme commander of the armed forces, 
Chancellor, Minister of War, and Commander-in-Chief of the Army. He was involved in every aspect of the German war effort, including new weapons development. How well did he perform these roles? He called himself a genius and was described as the greatest German military leader of all time by one of his most senior military leaders. Was he? What does the evidence show? Um, and then it says this book analyzes each of the Third Reich's uh, military campaigns, paying special attention to Hitler's role in them. Okay, so obviously, again, this book covers the Polish, Scandinavian, and French campaigns. And there are two others, which um, I will show in my next video. Uh, I think those have arrived. They, those are downstairs. But this sounds pretty interesting to me, too. I think I will be reading this one. Hitler's Imperfect Victory is... Oh, uh, wow. Oof, this is a hardcore book. Okay. Nah. Get ready for this one. This is Pen and Sword, and this is Bioterrorism and Biological Warfare, Disease as a Weapon of War by Paul Crystal. Um... The, okay. This important, disturbing, and timely book focuses on the use of disease and germs as a weapon of mass destruction and the threat bioterrorism poses in an increasingly unpredictable and volatile future for the world. Um, so for context, it traces developments from the earliest primitive but effective days of infectious rams, poison-tipped arrows, and plague-infected corpses used as toxic disease-spreading projectiles to the 21st century industrial scale weaponization of biomedicine. Is everything okay there, girls? Um, the, oh, the wind just slammed the door. Hang on a second. Okay. Sorry about that. We have a uh, weather moving in. We're having a, uh, geez, the temperature just plummeted and then big gust of wind slam the door we're gonna have rain and and, and uh, rain tonight and tomorrow and it's gonna be much cooler we had close to well we had 80 80 degrees yesterday if you can believe that um but yeah uh, back to this one um it it looks at every aspect of bioterrorism and biological warfare um so it's kind of I think this could be pretty fascinating here uh, in a very kind of dark way, scary way, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's contains chapters on biological weapons in the Arab world, China. Um, it details the physical, psychological, and economic effects on target populations. Um, I think that the or the earlier the history will be very fascinating. He cover he has a chapter on the Middle Ages, um, ancient warfare like the elephant and pig at the siege of Edessa. Look at this Rome and her enemies, um, biological warfare in the Bible. So I think those early chapters for sure are really going to grab my attention, and I think, um, uh, yeah, this is going to be interesting. I like how we kind of goes at it from ancient history all the way up um so yeah it's pretty uh extensive as you can see it covers all these different ages here let me get my there you go so this is by uh paul crystal and this is out right now from pennant sword Then we have, what do we have next here? Ooh, and this one is a, an, an award winner here. Ooh, oh, oh, I've got a, I've got a neat little postcard with this. Um, th now we're gonna move to Vietnam. This looks pretty cool. This is another t memoir, but also kind of, uh, wow, this is a glossy pub sheet for this. Um, I think I've sh shown this one before. Why is this over here? Oh, 
Ooh, guys. Well, this might have snuck in. Um, this, I think I showed this last year sometime. But it doesn't hurt to show it again. I'll just show it real quick. It is a... Um, it's called uh, Vietnam Combat, Firefights, and Writing History by Robin Bartlett. And it won the big New York City, the big book award winner. Wow. Congratulations. That's fantastic. Um, let's see. Ooh. Reader Views gave it five-star review. Um... Had a nice write up in Publishers Weekly. Let's see here. Promoted to first lieutenant at the height of the Vietnam War, Robin Bartlett, just 22 years old, assumed leadership of the 1st Platoon A Company, 1st Battalion, 5th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division, say that fast, um, Air Mobile in May 1968. The unit had more helicopter support than any other unit in Vietnam. They could call on near-immediate support in a firefight, and wounded soldiers could be medevaced even in dense jungle using jungle penetrators. This mobility meant that Bartlett's platoon could be deployed into hot landing zones, also known as LZs, um, at a moment's notice, and they were. Over the next seven months, Bartlett would lead his platoon of 30 men on helicopter combat assaults, ambushes, and search-and-destroy missions throughout the lowlands and jungles of 1st Corps along the DMZ. Bartlett's vivid combat experiences are brought to light in a fast-moving first-person narrative that encapsulates the horror, fear, anguish, and sometimes illogical humor of that war. There's a picture of our author in the field there. Um, this looks good. So if I've shown this before, I apologize, but... Uh, uh, it's definitely been noticed in uh, some of the more major outlets so yay good for Robin Bartlett and good for Casemate getting some of their books recognized which they, they deserve that they got a lot of good titles um, then we have uh, then we're going to go to World War I this looks like it's part of a series from Pen and Sword um, I think it's maybe called Battlegrounds Battleground. This is the American Expeditionary Forces in the Great War, Blue Wood and Val. Uh, June 1st to 26th, uh, 1918, and July 1st, 1918, by Martin Ott. It's a smaller little paperback from Pen and Sword. Um, let's see here. Oh, what a great photograph. Look at these. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. I've never seen that one before. Series editor. Yes. Okay. So, um, American and French soldiers in a trench. I love the photographs. I just, some of these books just have, uns I've never seen some of these photographs before. Um, So I think this is the series is actually about the American Expeditionary Forces. So there's more than one book, apparently. Um, it's a nice introduction about the battle. But it just says here the, the American Expeditionary Forces in the Great War joins over... Oh, it is a battleground series. Okay, yeah. The Battleground series has like over 160 published titles. Um, and these are just focusing on a blue wood. Mm. Got some bodies in here. Um, and Vo um, shows some of the explosions. It's, it's, it's richly illustrated, which is really nice. It's kind of a, a fast read. Maybe something you might want to take if you're uh, visiting those areas. Um, over in Europe, like a tour guide type of thing, you know. Um, but yeah, Baloo Wood and Val, um, just, 
I don't know what else to say about that. So that looks interesting. I've got a leaning tower that's about to fall over on the floor here. Um, and then what do we have here? This is interesting. <laughs> this one, I think they sent me. I wasn't, I was, didn't, I hadn't even requested it, but it looks interesting. Um, and if I ha if I've shown this one before, I apologize. I, I've, I've gotten kind of behind on my casemates, so I'm trying to catch up. So if I have ones I've shown before, then you've got a really good memory. <laughs> um, this is Frogman Stories, Life and Leadership Lessons from the SEAL Teams by Rick Kaiser. It's a casemate title. It's very slim. Um, it says here, Silver Star recipient Rick Kaiser shares his leadership lessons from over four decades with the Navy SEAL Teams. Um, uh, let's see here. A compelling look at U.S. Navy SEALs through a true-to-life lens focused on the triumphs and challenges of the elite warriors of the Special Forces community. Master Chief Rick Kaiser, retired, captures over 45 years of events in and around the SEAL teams. It is not a blood-and-guts portrayal of battlefield victories and losses, but an authentic view of how things are done in the teams. Interesting. The SEALs truly are silent professionals, and the most memorable stories often don't feature combat, but are the moments that shape these exceptional warriors. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, this, this will be good. Um, very slim volume, 146 pages. And yeah, they're, they're leadership lessons. Um, Trust your gut. Risk and reward. Um, like each chapter has kind of like a, a maxim. Never say never. And then we've got a few photos, um, color photos throughout. So, Frogman Stories by Rick Kaiser. That looks really good. All right. We'll be up here. This is a casemate title. Um, I've never heard of this person, so this is interesting. I think I've shown this one. Loyalty First, The Life and Times of Charles A. Willoughby, MacArthur's Chief Intelligence Officers by David A. Foy. Um, I think I've shown this one because this one came out last uh, fall. Um... Let's see here, yeah. The first full biography examines Willoughby's shadowy origins in his native Germany, his curious arrival in the United States, his military service in World War I, as well as his work during the interwar years as a junior diplomat, budding historian, and neophyte intelligence officer. His chance encounter with MacArthur in the mid-1930s would prove to be the genesis of a near-symbiotic relationship between the two, with significant consequences for both. Willoughby is most often criticized for his failing to foresee the entry of Chinese forces into the Korean War and its impact upon the U.S. Army and the prosecution of the war. Interesting. Following MacArthur's removal by President Truman in 1951, Willoughby retired and spent the rest of his days engaged in right-wing political activity and in staunchly defending his much maligned boss. This new biography assesses Willoughby's performance as a professional intelligence officer, both in World War II and Korea, where he is often vilified for his inaccurate assessments of enemy strength and most likely courses of action, as well as his sycophantic relationship with his commander. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think... Ooh... I might have to revisit this book because I read um, Jeff Shara's novelization of the Korean War, or a part of it, the Chosin Reservoir Battle, uh, the Frozen Hours, which I loved. And he mentions he he does a scene or two with MacArthur, and then there's this one guy that he worked with who was just an, an a hole. I think it might have been Willoughby because he's like, oh yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah, no, no, there's no Chinese up there. And then what happens, right? So I think <laughs> this might behoove me to actually read this biography of um, what I was going to um, at some point. But now I'm like, I just remember from that Jeff Shara novel that I think he uh, 
he he wrote about this guy and he was really um, annoying in that book. <laughs> so loyalty first, a biography about Willoughby, MacArthur's chief of intelligence or non-intelligence, as it were. Uh, let's see here. Um, this is a collection of uh, it's 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 housed under the category of modern warfare. But it looks like it's a collection of memories and memoirs and stories, um, which I, I like. And this is Battle Scars, 20 Years Later, 3rd Battalion. 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, uh, looks back at the Iraq War and how it changed their lives by Chip Reed. This is a casemate book here. Uh, let's see. The most eye-opening and terrifying story in Chip Reed's career as a journalist was the six weeks he spent with 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, during the invasion of Iraq in 2003 as a correspondent for NBC News. Oh, Chip Reed. Oh, that Chip Reed. What? Yeah, okay. Traveling shoulder sh to shoulder with the young Marines, he had unparalleled access, witnessing them in combat and interviewing as many as he could, persuade his bosses to put on air, allowing them to tell their war stories in their own words. It took only 22 days for the Marines of 3-5 to fight their way to Baghdad. But the effects on those who fought have lasted a lifetime. They lost a number of their own in battle, and others suffered life-threatening injuries. Of those who returned, even if they avoided physical scars, Many have had to find their own way through survivor's guilt and the nightmare of PTSD with all its attendant miseries. Twenty years on, Chip sat down with the Marines of 3-5 once more. They told Chip inspiring stories of heroism in battle, of camaraderie and comrades lost, of patriotism and belief in mission, of recovery and success in both military and civilian life, and of the new appreciation for life that results from post-traumatic growth. Visceral and searingly honest, this book is a tribute to the Marines for their service and for the many sacrifices they made then and that many still make today. So good for Chip Reed. Uh, thank you for writing that book, dude. There's Chip Reed. I knew that the name sounded familiar when they said NBC News. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen that guy's reports before. Um, well, good for him for writing a book in recognizing uh, the sacrifices and even the, you know the survivors survivors still make today um, this is nice pictures of a lot of the folks in here the the veterans and their families so battle scars by chip reed and I, an important new book from casemate <laughs> Where are we at? 43 minutes. We Then we have this interesting book. This is... This is a, a very recent book. came out just last month. Oh, well, mid-February. This is Strong and Will, Working for the American Embassy in Paris During the Nazi Occupation. By Marie-Louise Dilks, edited by Virginia A. Dilks. Strong and Will. Um, Marie Louise Dilks' astute observations of life in Paris during World War II are written from the unique perspective of the receptionist for the American embassy. The embassy was the first or last resort for many caught up in the chaos of war, and hers was the first face they would see as they walked through the grand doors. She takes us from the conquest and occupation of Paris by German forces, but includes the wartime journey of the American consulate in Paris, from, from Paris to Lisbon to Lyon to Bern and back to Paris. She ends with the triumphant return of members of the American embassy staff after the Allied forces, sorry, after the Allies forced the German army out of Paris and the reestablishment of the American embassy in Paris. Fabulous. That's interesting. That's a different perspective. Um, ooh. Oh, I like this. Yes, like diary um, entries 
I love stuff like that. That just puts you right back in time as if it were happening right that right you know, right now. Just puts you right back into it in present tense. So strong and will working for the American Embassy in Paris during the Nazi occupation. That sounds really good. Love it. Oops, sorry, it hit the microphone. All right, guys, let's see. So that's that's all I got for right now. That 45 minutes. Um, I hope you enjoyed this uh, selection of Casemate titles. Um, you know, I I support Casemate titles. I love their books. Um, you know, not, not everyone is like, you know, a winner. But, uh, <laughs> but a lot of them are. <coughs> Excuse me. There's so much pollen now. Um, everyone I know is sneezing, coughing, and uh, spring is here. No, but what I meant to say is, listen, I mean, I would be lying if I said every single book that I've gotten, you know, from Casemate is... is, is uh, uh, off the charts um but you know eight or eight or nine times out of ten i mean that's that's pretty dang good so uh i really enjoy military history from casemate and pen and sword books on um, a variety of other oops there goes the dogs other a variety of imprints that they they put out but um so i vouch for them um and as you see on this channel i i feature a lot of their titles and a lot of these are calling my name right now <laughs> I have to finish a book review for uh, another um, publication so I've got to actually finish reading the book and write a review tonight um, but a couple of these are going to be a, I'm going to boot them over to my bedside table and start perusing all right guys so thanks for joining me for another um, new military history roundup um, and uh, let me know what you like what looks interesting Roxy is eating a bone that is bigger than her head. <laughs> she's got spirit, that girl. Right, Roxy? Yeah, she says, I'm doing it. All right, guys. Until next time, thanks for joining me here on the History Shelf. I hope to see you back here again real soon. Take care. Bye-bye.